demons, spirits, forces of evil. Throughout history, all religions have stories that describe unimaginable encounters with these mysterious evil entities. But what happens when these forces are able to take control of someone's own body, making them do and say unspeakable things that will strike fear into even the bravest of souls? Many years ago, my grandparents moved to Iowa after retiring. They bought this really old farmhouse just outside a local town. It's one of those places where if you blink too slowly, you'd miss it driving past, really out in the sticks, you know? I remember going there as a kid, so I knew the place quite well. But nothing would prepare me for what I uncovered later on in life. Years later, my grandmother passed away, and my grandfather asked for our help sorting through some of her things, mainly clearing out old boxes from the attic because he was getting too old to lift them himself. Of course, we said we would help. That weekend, my mom and I took a long drive and made our way over to my grandparents' old house. It was a lot smaller than I'd remembered, and you could really see how it had aged throughout the years. Large creeper vines and patches of mold had started ruining some of the woodwork, and the paint was looking tired and weathered. Grandfather made a pot of tea, and we spent some time talking about life, and how we all remembered my grandmother. Shortly after that, we got to work clearing out the attic. It was a small, claustrophobic room just above the hallway upstairs. I slowly made my way into the dusty old room, trying to cover my face with my shirt to avoid breathing in all the dust, and I saw several chaotic stacks of boxes, all with different labels. Most of it was just old junk from back in the day, photo albums, old paperwork, report cards from when my mom was little, and things like that. But as we made progress sorting through these boxes, we came across a smaller box in the far back corner that stood out with its different appearance. It had no label and seemed to be much older than the others. It looked as if it was basically disintegrating from age. I asked my mom if she knew what it was, but she had no idea. It must have been here already when my grandparents moved in, all those years ago. Intrigued, I opened it and went through what was inside. For the most part, it was just old newspaper clippings, a very old Bible, some handwritten notes in German, and a few glass bottles that I didn't recognize. Then something interesting caught my eye, a leather-bound book with a golden circle and cross imprinted. I flipped through and saw some pretty strange things, sketches, scribbles and notes, and some kind of liquid damage on some of the pages. But something about this book seemed really unusual it had a sort of intensity and life amidst all these old relics. I stashed it aside in my backpack to check it out later and decided I would carry on with the task at hand first. A few hours passed and it got too late to drive back, so my mother and I decided we would spend the night at my grandfather's place and finish up in the morning. After dinner that night, I made my way to the spare room to get ready for bed, and as I lay down, I had an itch to look into what this book I'd found was all about. I took it out from my backpack and began to page through. At first, it took me a while to understand what I was looking at, but after studying it for a few minutes, it started to make sense to me. I was looking at the memoirs of a priest called Father Theophilus Riesinger, who, besides many other personal notes, had been documenting what he described as a demonic possession. The first few pages explained how he had been commissioned by the church in 1912 to investigate a case of strange behaviors that a family in Iowa believed to be a possession by an evil entity. The host victim was someone called Anna Eklund, a young woman whose father had reached out to the church for help after realizing that his daughter was physically unable to enter churches and would experience repulsion as if pushed by a literal barrier each time he tried taking her in. It also said that Anna would have fits of rage and disgust each time someone would bring a Bible or a cross near her. I continued reading, and the next pages went into detail about how Father Riesinger had anointed the afflicted woman with holy water, to which she responded with howls of pain and unexplainable welts and boils that bulged, searing from her flesh. The father was quite vivid in his descriptions, and even went so far as to create illustrations of what he witnessed, crude and disturbing sketches of a woman levitating above a bed, cuts strong across her arms and legs and pale white eyes piercing through the page. I decided I'd read enough of this disturbing book, and yet I couldn't look away. Quietly and slowly, I turned the pages and found another entry, July 19, 1912. 
Here the father expresses his frustrations and feelings of exhaustion, struggling to continue under seemingly irreparable conditions. He explains how the young girl had scratched deep wounds into her skin that the family would have to keep bandaging up to protect her. And each time he would recite the Lord's Prayer, the girl would expel deep animalistic growls and phrases in Aramaic, a long-forgotten language that Anna most certainly could not have learned, the language, in fact, of none other than Christ himself. It was very late and my eyes burned with a mix of curiosity and fatigue from the long day I'd had. I gently rocked into an abrupt sleep, and my eyes closed. I awoke in what I can only describe as a lucid dream, a state of both being unconscious, but also fully aware of where I was. But there was something wrong. I wasn't me. I had become Father Riesinger, and I was making my way into the same house I was in now, but many years ago. I could tell because the house looked new and there was nothing in view for miles. I, as Father Riesinger, made my way up a flight of stairs and opened a bedroom door, the very room I was asleep in right now. In front of me was a grotesque sight, a young woman with bright purple flesh and cuts all over, so much more disturbing than the reverend's sketches. The air was thick and cold, but created a burning sensation in my throat when I breathed. As I moved closer to the girl, I started to notice she was not actually on the bed, but floating as if held up by an invisible force, just inches above the bed. To add to the tension, there was a low, constant growl coming from her mouth that hung open as if petrified in place. In the dream, without thinking, I began reciting prayers and ended by demanding the foul beast exit this child of God and crawl back from whence it came. I cannot properly describe what happened next, but it felt almost like an invisible and powerful hand had grabbed a hold of my insides and began squeezing and scraping. Anna's head rocked limply side to side on her shoulders, like a grim rag doll, and bobbed upside down in an unnatural rotation to look back at me. And all the while, her mouth remaining open and the bestial growl intensifying. I knew I was staring into the mouth of hell itself, and it was real. Here I was, a man alone, facing the forces of the devil. Suddenly a flash of light exploded, and I felt an incredible force flow through me, a conduit of pure energy, an infinite force. And just as suddenly as I had dozed off, I was awake and back in the spare room of my grandfather's house, my body covered in cold sweat. What a nightmare, I thought, and I immediately looked at the book which I noticed had been thrown across the room and was lying face down on the floor in front of me. I don't know what actually happened that night, but I was certain that the demonic presence I had experienced was directly linked to that book, almost as if a silent force had latched itself to the object and resided within its pages. It terrified me. All I could think at the time was I wanted absolutely nothing to do with this dark and evil entity or the cursed pages harboring it. The next day I took the book out to the backyard before anyone woke up and I buried it. I wanted to make sure this thing never saw the light of day again. I never told anyone what I experienced that night, but it's a memory that has haunted me for years now. It felt so real, and even to this day still makes me question what kind of evil forces exist just outside of the world we know, and how big a part our faith plays in keeping us safe from the clutches of darkness. After what I'd seen that night, there is no doubt in my mind that these things are real. Now I pray every night that I never encounter them again. Thanks for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed this video, give a thumbs up or leave a comment to let us know. And remember to subscribe and ring the bell if you want to hear more stories like these. Next week, we'll tell the real-life exorcism story that was so intense it even inspired a horror movie. Until next time, good night.